Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 4.1, uh, continuing on with vertebrates. So last time we uh, just got started on this chapter, enough to talk about uh, fishes. Uh, now we're going to turn our attention to uh, everything else. Uh, and incidentally, everything else can be defined by an evolutionary innovation uh, that the ancestor to amphibians, mammals, reptiles, and birds had, uh, and that is the evolution of four limbs. So this, uh, it's called a superclass, uh, but it's just a clade here. This superclass is called tetrapoda. And yep, that's amphibians, uh, mammals, birds, and reptiles, all um, sharing the common ancestor with four limbs. So tetrapoda, four feet. Yeah, superclass tetrapoda members have four limbs, and this is going to include all further groups in this chapter. So among these tetrapods, uh, let's start down here with class amphibia, called amphibians. So this is going to include frogs, toads, salamanders, and uh, Sicilians. We'll, we'll get to them soon enough. So uh, amphibians are the first land vertebrates. Uh, so before this, there were just different groups of fish that lived in aquatic environments. These are the first uh, vertebrates that were able to live on land. Uh, and of course, that evolutionary innovation we just talked about, the four legs, the tetrapoda, uh, that was you know required to, to make it to land. Limbs that can support weight outside of water. And uh, there were definitely some selective pressures that pushed towards this. There are some advantages to living on land. One is new food sources. You know, we talked about this in that intro to animals chapter that plants made it to land first. Uh, and so with, with plants in these terrestrial environments, there are definitely... Um, there's definitely an incentive to, to get on land as well, uh, and also to escape from predators that are purely aquatic. So these are both advantages to life on land for these uh, vertebrates. So if you're going to be on land, uh, the gills that your fish ancestors had are not going to cut it. Uh, so amphibians had to evolve lungs uh, to to extract oxygen, exchange gases with air instead of from water, uh, but they are kind of kind of bad lungs, <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about this when we get to our, our circulatory system chapter later on in the course. But the circulation of amphibians is is not great, so their efficiency in breathing is is pretty terrible. So to supplement their lungs, amphibians have something called cutaneous respiration, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, their skin is particularly thin, especially to the skin we'll see in other groups of tetrapods, and so they are able to exchange gases, getting rid of CO2, acquiring O2, just straight through their skin, through capillaries that are pressed up uh, against their skin. So uh, yeah, cut that's called cutaneous respiration, getting O2 through the skin. And this is done to supplement their lungs, which are uh, not the best. Um, another trait of amphibians is metamorphosis. So I'm sure we've all learned about this in elementary school, uh, you know, about frogs, but you know, other amphibians do this as well. Here's the northern crested newt uh, going from, you know, its egg, its, you know, newtlet stages, you know, uh, the tadpole growing these four legs and then, you know, becoming terrestrial. So uh, many undergo metamorphosis. They hatch in an aquatic environment with gills. Uh, and then eventually develop lungs and become terrestrial. Uh, there are going to be some exceptions to this, that's why I said many, uh, but yeah, it's, it's something that can be associated with amphibians. So again, th these are the first terrestrial vertebrates, but they, they still have to be close to water because for a lot of these, a substantial amount of their life cycle takes place in water. Uh, another factor that you know causes them to have to stay close to water is the fact that their skin, which as we just mentioned is particularly thin to enable cutaneous respiration, their skin uh, lacks protection and dries out easily and so do their eggs. Their eggs do not have any sort of shell or really protective barrier around them so both their skin and their eggs can easily dry out so they have to be either in water we're in very moist environments, so they again they can survive on land, but not very well. 
uh, not very far from, from abundant sources of water or some sort of moisture. Um, additionally, we can say about amphibians that most are ectotherms. We defined this earlier in the chapter when we were talking about fish. I said fish are mostly ectotherms as well. This is the so-called cold-blooded. Uh, they don't maintain normal body temperature. They, they get their heat from the environment. So, okay, th this is class amphibia. If we want to talk about more specific groups, the domain, kingdom, phylum, uh, class, order it would be next. So let's talk about some of the orders within class amphibia. Uh, up first is order uh, Urodella. These are salamanders. Uh, and, you know, I've got a couple examples here of actually some pretty atypical salamanders or atypical amphibians. Uh, this is an oxodal, which is kind of a weirdo uh, because it never develops lungs. It, it stays at this, uh, this stage where it has gills. Uh, it's a completely aquatic amphibian. It's very it's successful at doing this. Well, very beautiful looking gills. Uh, and this is another strange, uh, I mean, not that strange for salamanders, but you know, strange for amphibians. Uh, this is a uh, salamander that has neither gills nor lungs. It gets all of its gas exchange through cutaneous respiration. And, and the way it manages that is by being you know, rather small. We saw this in uh, invertebrates that managed to get away with not having any circulatory or respiratory systems at all by being small. You can kind of get the sense of this thing based on looking at the leaf that it's uh, that it's standing on. Uh, that yeah, there are a fair number of salamanders like this that have neither gills nor lungs. So order Urodella salamanders, and uh, many of them don't have lungs, uh, either gills only or cutaneous respiration only. Okay, that's all I got to say about this order. Again, we're moving fast when we get to the order level. Uh, another order is order A Nura. A means without, and Nura means tail, no tail. Yep, that's frogs and toads. Um, traditionally, toads have rougher skin and live in drier environments, and frogs have smoother skin and live in, in you know more more aquatic of, of lifestyles. That's not strictly true. Whether these are clades or not is in question, so uh, don't worry about that at all. <laughs> Just know uh, order a neura means frogs and toads. So, okay, next is order a poda. Again, a means without, poda for the millionth time. Poda means foot, so without foot. Uh, yeah, this is what it looks like to be without foot. Uh, this thing is called a Sicilian. It's uh, you know, spelled like this, uh, but it's pronounced like, you know, someone who's from the island of Sicily, uh, Sicilian. Uh, and uh, yeah, these are these are weird. They live in tropical environments throughout the world. They're about the size of an earthworm, uh, but, but they're, they're amphibians. These are not snakes. These are not worms. Uh, they're, they're vertebrates. And curiously, they're still tetrapods. So even though they don't have four limbs, when when we when we name these clades, I mean th these these clades exist uh, regardless of what we want to call them, and you know we choose a name, you know, trying to describe everything within this, and you know our our language is just never perfect. Uh, so the the ancestors to uh, all tetrapods had four limbs. That was a, a defining feature of the ancestors to all of this stuff. But, and we'll see this again when we get to birds, you can always lose features, even if it's, you know, part of the, the defining feature of your group. So these are not exceptions to this. All amphibians are in this, this clade of tetrapoda, uh, and, and so are Sicilians, despite lacking limbs. They're evolutionarily members of tetrapoda. So anyway, uh, I, I wish I could tell you more about them, uh, but they, there's not very much known about their diet and their, their lifestyle. So uh, just know that apoda means Sicilians. These things are poorly understood and limbless burrowing amphibians. And so not much else to say about them. So next up, uh, we're, we talk about reptiles. Uh, but actually, before we get to reptiles, there is another clade that emerges here. So tetrapoda included amphibians, mammals, reptiles, and birds. Now we have an evolutionary innovation that is shared by mammals, reptiles, and birds. This evolutionary innovation is a structure called the amnion. So members of this clade, mammals, reptiles, birds, are called 
amniotes. So what is the amnion? Well, remember how I told you amphibian eggs had this you know, tendency to dry out, and so they had to be laid in water or in very moist environments? Well, the amnion is a solution to that problem. Uh, so here's a, uh, an embryo developing, and then here is the amnion. So the amnion is a structure that surrounds the embryo and is filled, uh, the amniotic cavity is filled with amniotic fluid. And uh, this keeps the embryo from drying out. So uh, instead of having to lay the egg in the water, uh, you surround the embryo with water in a membrane and put that in a shell, or sometimes put that in a shell, and, and then your embryo will not dry out. Uh, now, curiously, you know, this is a shelled egg, so this is a this is a reptile or a bird embryo we're looking at here. But remember, this amniotes clade includes reptiles, birds, and mammals as well. So we don't have shelled eggs, but we do have an amnion. So uh, here is, you know, a human uh, embryo. And yeah, there's the amniotic fluid and there's the amnion. So it's something all these groups share. Um, if uh, you've ever heard of or seen a woman going into labor and her water breaks, uh, that is the, the amniotic sac uh, breaking and this amniotic fluid coming out because that baby's about to be born, it doesn't need this anymore, and, and so that, that water coming out is, is amniotic fluid. So, okay, how do I summarize all this? Uh, clade amniota, uh, members called amniotes. Uh, the embryo is surrounded by amniotic fluid encased in an amniotic sac. This cushions and hydrates the growing embryo. So uh, again, this is a major step forward. Eggs no longer need to be laid in water or moist environments. So this opens up a lot of new, uh, you know, drier territory for these vertebrates to colonize. Uh, and this uh, amnio, uh, amnion can be encased within a shell or within the mother's body, as, as we see with uh, virtually all mammals. So this clade amniota includes all further groups. Uh, so, okay, uh, now we're ready to go to reptiles, right? Well, no. Uh, there are actually three clades within amniota based on skull based on a, a particular skull structure called the temporal fenestra. So what's going on with this? Well, these are the three uh, ways to have a, a temporal fenestra. Uh, anapsids are uh, vertebrates that don't have any temporal fenestra at all. A temporal fenestra is defined in the key terms. Uh, here we go. Yep. Uh, it's defined in the key terms as a non-orbital opening in the skull that may allow muscles to expand and lengthen. Uh, so non-orbital means not the eye. Uh, and, and so here's what this looks like, another opening here. So anapsids don't have this extra opening. Uh, so, you know, A means without. Uh, so anapsids don't have uh, temporal fenestra, no temporal fenestra. Uh, they're all extinct. So this is... <laughs> This absolute unit uh, of, a, of a, an extinct anapsid here. Uh, not going to make a, a play at trying to pronounce this. Uh, yeah, th these these are these are all extinct, but it is a lineage that exists uh, within amniotes. Uh, if you do have one temporal fenestra, that puts you in a group called synapsids. Synapsids have one temporal fenestra. Uh, this includes mammals uh, and proto-mammals. Uh, I mentioned these before. They reigned in the in the Permian period before the Permian extinction event. So uh, that's why I said these things uh, were more closely related to mammals than they are to, to reptiles or dinosaurs. Uh, they're synapsids, just like we are. And finally, it's possible to have two temporal fenestrae. That's how you pluralize that. Uh, if you have two temporal fenestrae, you are a diapsid, uh, and these this includes reptiles and birds. Uh, so you know, reptiles and birds closely related to one another because they're members of this clade, uh, diapsids. So, okay, with, with that out of the way, now it is finally time uh, to start talking about reptiles. So this 
uh, this is what reptiles are. Uh, this is what it looks like if you were to try to you know, draw a circle around what, what we call a reptile. And of course, this is an ancestor and not all of its descendants. Uh, this is, of course, to bring up this for the millionth time, this is a paraphyletic group. Actually, hey, the example we've been using this entire quarter uh, has been reptiles as a paraphyletic group. Uh, lizards and turtles and crocodiles, but we're not including birds here. Birds are not reptiles. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's excluding this group. It's, it's paraphyletic. Now, uh, I've been using this phylogenetic tree so far through you know fishes and amphibians uh, but at this point I actually want to switch over and use something that, that is a little bit more detailed okay take a second orient yourselves here this is a phylogenetic tree of just amniotes so uh, we're not showing amphibians or fish here uh, ancestral amniote this one goes from the left to the right uh, and yeah you can see those three clades that i mentioned a minute ago synapsida anapsida and diapsida so synapsids yep that's going to lead to mammals anapsid they're all extinct and then diapsids reptiles and birds so Again, just to, to illustrate the paraphyletic nature of this, uh, within the clade diapsida, uh, you have to exclude birds if you want to define what a reptile is. So, yeah, paraphyletic group. You get it. Uh, reptiles, class, reptilia, paraphyletic group. They are, if, if you wanted to you know, try to describe them, synapsids that are not birds. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what a reptile is. So uh, what are some of their features? You know, we're familiar with these things, uh, alligators, crocodiles, uh, turtles, lizards. Well, uh, these uh, reptiles have scaly skin. Uh, so this prevents water loss. So, you know, alongside with uh, the, the amnion that surrounds their, their embryo, this again allows them to live in drier climates. Uh, the downside to having tough, thick, scaly skin is you can't breathe. You can't breathe through it anymore. And we will see this when we get to our chapter on the circulatory system later on. Uh, but reptiles experience an, an upgrade in their circulatory system that makes them more efficient, and so they, they can they can do without cutaneous respiration. But it's worth noting that this this is gone uh, with this scaly skin. Most reptiles are ectotherms. Uh, again, this is the third time I've used this term, uh, and they have a propensity for using the environment to heat their body. So, you know, this kind of basking or sunning behavior, uh, using, you know, sunlight to warm themselves up because they're not, you know, constantly burning a lot of energy to keep themselves at a, at a normal hot temperature. So I, I do want to go into this in um, a little bit more detail now, just because I, I think it's interesting. Um, the advantage to this ectotherm lifestyle is that you have reduced caloric needs. Uh, animals that are endotherms, like, like we get, well, I'll define that soon enough, but that means you know warm-blooded, uh, burn a lot of calories keeping, keeping themselves warm. So allowing yourself to fluctuate in body temperature and getting free heat from the sun instead of you know burning it yourself, you save a lot of calories. And in fact, uh, and this can vary a little bit depending on on uh, the you know endotherm versus ectotherm. But uh, reptiles, ectotherms can survive on about a tenth of the calories used by similarly sized endotherms. So yeah, it allows you to survive at the tenth uh, of the amount of food as someone who's warm-blooded. That's a definite advantage. Um, but the disadvantage is uh, if the temperature is cold, if you're not able to sun like this, yep, you're going to be sluggish, you're not going to move you know, very quickly, your muscles aren't going to work well. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that is a disadvantage to saving all of this energy. Okay, uh, let's go through some specific groups. Let's start. Well, let's start. Let's start with the cool one. Let's start where we all want to start. Let's start with uh, with dinosaurs. So this is going to include hadrosaurs and stegosauruses, triceratopses, uh, and birds. I mentioned this in an earlier lecture. Birds are dinosaurs. Uh, when we talk about birds, we're going to see their ancestor 
was a dinosaur, so go to, to this. Uh, they evolved from this specific group of dinosaurs. Uh, and so if we define Dinosauria as a clade, that means it is an ancestor and all of its descendants. So, of course, that gets us our, our T. rex and our triceratops, uh, but it gets us, you know, our, our ducks and chickens here as well. Uh, they're part of this clade Dinosauria. Birds are dinosaurs. So... Clade Dinosauria, we call them dinosaurs. Uh, it's a diverse group. Uh, that, again, I mentioned this a couple chapters ago. They were the dominant vertebrates until about 65 million years ago. Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event uh, wiped out all of them except for the avian dinosaurs, except for birds. All you know, so all these are, are extinct except for birds, and birds are avian dinosaurs. You could distinguish these from the rest by calling the others non-avian dinosaurs. We've kind of been through this already, but I'm bringing it up again. Okay, uh, continuing on uh, with this phylogenetic tree. So that's all I, all I really wanted to say about dinosaurs. I know there's a lot more to say, but you know, in the interest of time, we gotta go through all this stuff. Uh, let's talk about pterosaurs. So uh, contrary to popular opinion, these are not dinosaurs. They lived amongst the dinosaurs. They are also reptiles, uh, but they're not within that clade dinosauria. So they, uh, they're they called flying reptiles. Uh, and it, it's, it would be easy to conclude that birds evolved from these pterosaurs. Uh, they, they both have the ability to, to fly. Uh, that's one of, that could be considered one of those uh, synapomorphies, those shared features. They both fly because they have a common ancestor. But that's not the case. This is yet another example of convergent evolution. Uh, pterosaurs evolved the ability to fly completely independently of birds, which also evolved the ability to fly. So convergent evolution explains them you know, both having the same ability, not a close shared ancestor. So order pterosauria, pterosaurs, they're flying. Yep, they're all extinct. And yeah, not closely related to birds. Flight is convergent evolution. And again, these are not uh, dinosaurs. They're flying reptiles. Okay, uh, moving up here, crocodilia. Okay, this one's pretty obvious based on the name. These are crocodiles. These are alligators. These are gharials and caimans. Uh, I'm just going to say crocodiles and alligators here. And yeah, we, we know and love these things. They're primarily aquatic carnivores. So yeah, that's, that's all you need to know about crocodiles if you didn't know that already. Uh, let's move to something that you may not know a lot about. So uh, let's move on to, to these two, which uh, you know are sort of lumped together in what's called order rhynchocephalia. So, okay, this is lizards, right? This thing looks like a lizard. We must be talking about lizards now, right? No. So uh, despite how much this looks like a lizard, this is a distinct branch in uh, in in, di in uh, reptiles, uh, members of order Rhynchocephalia, and by members, uh, I mean there's only one member still alive today. Uh, it's called a Tuatara. Uh, it only lives in New Zealand, and man, it's weird. Uh, so it's its upper jaw. Well. This is only showing its upper jaw. The teeth on both its upper jaw and its lower jaw are actually just extensions of the skull. They're just sharpened to bone. They're not actually separate teeth uh, like we're used to having. And the reason why I'm showing just the upper jaw here, the upper jaw here at the back actually has two rows of teeth. Uh, so you can imagine the lower jaw sort of, which has a single row, fitting in between these two rows of teeth creating some, some pretty gnarly shearing action here as these teeth fit into one another. That's a type of, of dentation, a tooth pattern, that you don't see at all in, in other reptiles and, and not in lizards. And, you know, uh, perhaps the even freakier thing uh, is the third eye that they have on the top of their heads. So this is, uh, you know, not as you know, highly developed as the other two eyes. Uh, it's not, you know, doesn't have a lens or capable of focusing light in the same way, but it is a light sensing organ and it's, it's poorly understood, but it's thought to play some role in its, in its sleep regulation, day night cycle sort of stuff. So yeah, maybe you hadn't heard of these before. I hope not. Now you do. Uh, order Rhynchocephalia. They're all extinct except for one member of the Tuatara in New Zealand. Uh, double row of upper teeth, 
part of the jawbone. Again, that's weird. Uh, and a, a poorly understood third eye. So yeah, superficially it looks a lot like a lizard, but it, it, it is evolutionarily very different. Um, if we do want to talk lizards, though, the, we have to go down to uh, order squamata, which is actually not just lizards, uh, but snakes as well. Um, if you want to distinguish between lizards and snakes, you have to get more specific, but uh, at the order level, it includes all of this stuff. Snakes are, uh, once again, like, you know, Sicilians, these are tetrapods that have lost their limbs for the sake of, you know, having this close to the ground, slithering lifestyle. Uh, there was selective pressure to, to live in this way. Uh, and, you know, it's always easier to lose a feature than it is to gain it. Uh, and so, yep, you have, you know, more limbless vertebrates here. Um, and yeah, we're pretty familiar with these. Order Squamata is snakes and lizards. Uh, incidentally, this is the largest order of reptiles that are alive today, at least. Uh, and yes, snakes are members of Tetrapoda clade. They've lost their limbs as part of their evolution. We still consider them uh, to be tetrapods. Okay, moving along. Uh, order Testudines. A uh, little bit of a question exactly how it fits in here, but we don't need to worry about this in our course. I'm, I'm never going to ask a test question where I ask how, how closely related any of these groups are to any of these other groups or whatever, so don't worry about this. Uh, test two dinies is turtles and tortoises. So uh, again, these are animals that we're all pretty familiar with. They've got a protective shell of bone. And actually, it, it is made of bone, so they, they can't come out of their shell. They are their shell. This their their vertebrae and ribs are fused to this carapace. It's uh it's a it's a part of their part of their body. Um, interestingly here is their skull. Uh, and if you look at this closely and you remember a few minutes ago, hopefully you're a little confused about things. Here's the orbit. You know, it's the eye. Here's where it attaches to the to the vertebrae, um, and there's nothing else here. This is an anapsid skull. But wait a second, I, I said anapsids. <laughs> I can't look at this thing without chuckling a little bit. I said anapsids were all extinct, uh, and I had said that reptiles were members of this uh, this diapsid group. There's supposed to be two temporal fenestrae. Well. Maybe you can guess where I'm going with this. Uh, just like snakes losing the ability to, you know, the, the four limbs of their tetrapod ancestors for reasons that are not understood, uh, more uh, members of order Testudines have lost both of their temporal fenestrae. So they're still in this synapsid clade. The, the question mark is only, you know, where they fit in. It, it's, it, or not, I'm sorry, not synapsid, diapsid. I misspoke, I apologize. They're still in this diapsid diapsid clade, the question is only exactly where they fit in. They've lost these temporal fenestrae as part of their evolution. So uh, it's weird, but interesting. So uh, order testudines, turtles and tortoises, protective shell bone, uh, anapsid morphology. They're not members of the anapsid clade. They have anapsid morphology uh, and, you know, their temporal fenestrae uh, have been lost. Okay. Uh, and so that does it for, uh, I mean, not talking about pleosaurs or, or ichthyosaurs, so I'm skipping a couple of these things. Uh, that, that does it for reptiles. So moving on, uh, we're going to kind of leave mammals to the side for now. So moving on next uh, up, we're going to talk about birds. So back to this amniote phylogenetic tree. Here we go. There's where birds fit in. Again, I mentioned before they evolved from a group of dinosaurs. Uh, thankfully, this is a simple, straightforward monophyletic group now. So class Aves, also known as birds, monophyletic group. And uh, up here's the diagram showing some of the evolutionary uh, steps here. Uh, their dinosaur ancestors had birds, but weren't really capable, or sorry, had feathers, uh, but were not really capable of flight. Uh, a key evolutionary innovation from, you know, feathers to just sort of insulate to feathers that allow for flight is the asymmetrical nature of these feathers. And so, yep, you've got various dinosaurs on the path to birds. There's the Archaeopteryx, the first, uh, the first thing that we consider to be a, a true bird. And then, you know, modern birds of today. So birds evolved from non-avian dinosaurs. 
and flight was a key feature in their evolution. Uh, flight was a, you know, a driving force in their evolution, and a lot of the features that they have relate directly or indirectly uh, to the ability to fly. So many bird traits relate to flight. Uh, one of these is endothermy. So I referenced this earlier, but now I, I brought it up for real, and it's in the key terms. Endothermy, also known as being warm-blooded, uh, means a capable, an animal capable of maintaining a relatively constant internal body temperature. So they are constantly burning a lot of calories to keep their body temperature warm, even when it's cold around them. Um, uh, Haughty, this is related to flight because a higher body temperature makes chemical reactions go faster, which makes muscles perform better. Flying is really hard, <laughs> and so uh, having you know better muscle performance in, in a warmer body it does relate in a way to their ability to fly. Uh, the downside, as we mentioned before, when we were talking about ectothermy, uh, is uh, relatively high caloric needs. So sort of uh, related to this in a way, another bird trait is feathers. Uh, I, I said they were asymmetrical compared to some symmetrical feathers that we see in their dinosaur ancestors. And so I just mean that uh, on either side of this vein in the middle, they're not symmetrical. <laughs> Those are the feathers uh, that allow them to fly. Uh, but this relates to the endothermy because feathers are also useful for insulation. So if you're burning a lot of energy, a lot of calories, keeping yourself warm all the time, having feathers, uh, down feathers, uh, that can insulate you and bottle in some of that heat and avoid losing it to the environment, that's really helpful. So they're involved in flight, but also in reducing calorie loss from endothermy. Uh, another feature related to flight is they're sometimes called hollow bones. They're not completely hollow, but they're a lot more hollow than the bones of other vertebrates. And yeah, th this, is a, this is a weight reduction thing. Uh, these air-filled bones uh, you know, reduce the amount of weight uh, that the bird has, makes it easier to fly. Uh, another thing is, we can kind of see this here, uh, the the movement from a, a jaw with teeth, uh, and we see some of the very early birds did have a jaw with teeth, to the beaks uh, of the birds that, that we know and love today. This is another weight reduction thing. Uh, so air-filled bones and a beak are other features that, uh, again, indirectly relate to flight because they reduce body weight. Um, and finally, we have structures called air sacs. Um, this it gets kind of complicated, uh, but the the short version is when you breathe in, air comes into your lungs. When you breathe out, air exits your lungs. So when you're breathing in, you know you can you can run and jump and perform really well, but it's hard for you to to do that kind of work when you're on the, on the exhale. Birds have these structures called air sacs, so when they breathe in, some air comes to the lungs, but some of that air goes to these air sacs where it's not actually doing gas exchange. When they exhale, you know, breathing out this air that's you know, had its oxygen extracted, some of that air from the air sacs moves into the lungs, so they are getting fresh air even when they are exhaling. So, okay, I'm not, not gonna write all that down. You should just know that, that there is specialized airflow in the lungs of birds, uh, and that is definitely a trait that, that aids them in their ability to fly. Okay, now if we wanna talk about uh, specific orders of birds, Oh, we are going to get bogged down really, really, really quickly because there are dozens of different orders of birds. And, you know, to be quite honest, most of these are things that we're familiar with. I, I And, you know, I would only be doing a, in an intro biology class, only be doing, a, you know, a rough go through of any of these. So we, we know flamingos and owls and, and peacocks and puffins and hummingbirds. So I'm, I'm not going to go through at this level at all. I'm, I'm just going to say uh, class Aves has over 30 orders uh, and they're highly diverse, you know, different food sources, different uh, living strategies, again, going back to this, 
birds evolved you know, to fly, but plenty of these have lost the ability to fly, to live in aquatic environments instead, or have lost the ability to fly, uh, to, you know, conquer terrestrial environments instead. So yeah, 30 orders, highly diverse. That's, that's all there is to birds. Okay. Up next is mammals, uh, but this is typically where I run out of time in uh, the recorded lecture 4.1, so we'll pick up mammals in the next one. This is the end of lecture 4.1.